I even remembered on my own, amazingly. Okay, so you should all have your, uh, your prompt. And second order of business is, of course, my t-shirt du jour. I will show you what I have for you today. Let me find, I also have a picture of it. Let me find the pictures I could But you'll have to show the, ad the address, the website where we can buy it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, only, not only the t-shirt. We need more. We need more. Well, you'll see. There's other merchandise today that I will that I will draw to your to your attention. You um, should start selling them. <laughs> oh, I think another be, business is starting. There'd be a conflict uh, of interest. Business. There'd be a conflict of interest there. But let me uh, yeah. let me uh, find. Uh, yeah. Okay. So here is my T-shirt du jour. It is a. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but up close, it's the uh, Mayan calendar system. And I can show you a photo of it, which is, there, there's the photo. This uh, Tzolkin here is the Mayan word for calendar. And this is, this is a writing system known um, as Mayan uh, glyphs. Uh, yeah, there we go. Things get a bit crowded here, I realize, but um, known as Mayan glyphs, with shortening or clipping, we know about clippings for uh, hieroglyphs. Like uh, the Egyptian system, it's a mixed uh, system of logograms, a logographic system that is word writing and also phonetic uh, uh, system. And it was, it was used for a variety of purposes, but uh, one of its um, uh, key uses was in uh, the Mayan uh, calendar system, the cal uh, Calendario Maya. This is this T-shirt is from Guatemala. I'm not sure where exactly you could find it if you want it, but it's um, but you could there there you'll see in a moment that there's uh, there's plenty of other uh, merchandise. It was uh, deciphered in the 1960s, uh, uh, sort of definitively deciphered in the in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, the work of, of Yuri uh, Kozarov was very important. He determined that there was a phonetic basis to the signs that at, at first it was thought for a long time, it was thought that they were just pictorial representations of, of various things. Um, and it was thought that there was that, it, that they were so-called logograms that is word writing, but he determined that there was a phonetic basis and that and that started the, the uh, sort of serious development of a uh, decipherment uh, so that it's actually, it's quite well understood now. Um, one of the, uh, I'll show you uh, in a moment if I can find it here. Uh, yeah, here are some, some pictures of, uh, of it. It was used in monumental uh, uh, purposes. So this is on a, a steely, a, a large uh, uh, wooden, or I'm sorry, a stone um, monument that, that marks uh, uh, different occasions and different events in different uh, places. Uh, so the writing was, was on, on that. Uh, it was also found in, uh, it, uh, written on manuscripts uh, uh, front that were um, developed during the, uh, uh, by the work of Spanish missionaries in, uh, in the uh, Southern Mexico and, and Guatemala in the 16th century. And, and so there are also uh, then these uh, handwritten versions of the of the signs uh, as as well, and they they you know here's here's an event and this is uh, a description of what's going on in the event. So it actually is, it's real writing. It's not just uh, it's not just uh, pictorial images. Um, I'll tell you a little more about it. Um, let me see. Oh yeah the. The, the, this, when, I, when I was talking about merchandise, I was not making things up uh, because first of all, here, this, is the, uh, this is information about the Mayan uh, uh, calendar. It was a uh, 260 days, 13 uh, days of, uh, 13 uh, um, months of 20 days. So it was quite different in, in, in terms of keeping the cycle of, of the sun uh, moving around the, uh, uh, or the, the, the positioning of the sun and the earth and the skies uh, quite different from the way from the uh, 360, 365 day um, 
uh, calendars that, that we're used to. Um, you can read about it. I'll, I'll put these uh, this link in the in the chat. I just got it from uh, uh, from Googling, so you can do the same, of course, if you if you want. But here is the uh, you can read a little more about it. Uh, there's a bit of, of information about the writing system uh, in the uh, uh, the textbook, the Hawk and Joseph textbook. But as I, I mentioned, merchandise because uh, as you will see, if I can get the right. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, there's a there. For any of you are gamers? There's a uh, a, a game uh, based on the Mayan calendar called Soul Game, um, and uh, other other merchandise uh, as well associated with with the calendar. So it's an exotic kind of thing, and it's been exoticized and turned into, uh, or the exotic nature has been exploited. Let's say, and uh, it's the basis for for a game. I don't know. I don't know. Is 7.9, is that a good rating? I think is that that's out of 10, I guess. Uh, so I don't know. So if there are any gamers, let me know if you play it and if it's fun. Um, and if and if not, and you can see there are, if you're looking for for a t shirt, uh, this you can all you have to do is is Google and you'll find something. This is a new game mechanism dynamic worker place and blah, blah, blah. So I'm not endorsing it. I'm not selling it. I'm simply mentioning that it's it, it's interesting that these uh, elements or artifacts that come out of our our uh, our uh, class discussion uh, sort of captivate popular imagination and and, and have uh, and have a role to play in uh, in uh, popular culture. So um, okay, so I think that's all for today on the uh, on the T-shirt. Uh, get rid of this for now, and I will put this away. I'm keeping in, in case you want a, a a record of it um, on the Carmen um, page for the for the class under the modules. There's a module with all of these photos of my of my T-shirts, so you can. Uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, it there are. 20, 20 months? What does it mean each of this? Uh, each of these, I, th I think, I think each one of these refers to a month. I don't really know a lot about it. I, I, I just got to, I bought the t-shirt because it was cool. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't, but, I didn't but buy But do you have it. an idea what uh, does it mean, these 20 images? Um, yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what. Next time, I'll do a bit a bit of research, and next time, I'll uh, next class on okay. Monday, I'll, I'll tell you some more about. about okay. Writing. Okay. Um, Thank you. One one thing that was uh, important once it was once it was determined that it was a real writing system, and by real writing, I mean that it was actually representing the the linguistic uh, that there was a real correlation between the the signs and and linguistic material. It wasn't just a you know, a picture of a dog, you say, oh, that means dog, a picture of, of a tree, that means tree. It, there, were, there was a real connection to, to linguistic material. So that's what uh, Leonard uh, Bloomfield, referred to as real writing. That is writing uh, pictorial representations that, that had a, a real connection with, with language. Um, so, so once it was determined that this was real writing, that this was a language-based uh, uh, visual representation, it led to the need to uh, revamp uh, hypotheses that have been held for, for, for many, many years about uh, how writing was invented. Uh, so from, the, from what we, we talked about last time, um, I, I said that writing seems to have emerged in, the, in ancient Egypt uh, that was the hieroglyphic system that we talked about in, in the ancient uh, Middle East, the cuneiform writing, and also in China at roughly the same time, roughly the same time. There's debate about which one was first and so forth. But, but for a long time, it was thought that, that the, that's sort of, a, uh, so from a northern, a northeastern Africa across the Middle East into, into Central Asia and China is sort of a continuous geographic uh, uh, band and it was thought that that what may have happened is that the writing developed in one one of those places, and the idea of writing uh, spread. Uh, that was referred to as 
uh, stimulus diffusion. So that uh, the idea of writing spread, even if the exact uh, manifestation of how that system took, took shape was different in Egypt, in the uh, Middle East and in, and in China. But once, the, once it was determined that, um, uh, and I'll, I'll say, I'll put stimulus diffusion with a question mark. Once it was determined that the Mayan system was real writing in, in Bloomfield's sense of, of connect, <clears throat> pictorial visual representations connected to language, that led to the need to revamp this hypothesis about stimulus diffusion and to recognize that writing could have developed independently in two different, at least two different parts of the world. That is somewhere in this Egypt uh, to China uh, uh, geographic zone and separately in Mesoamerica, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Mexico and Central America. Um, <clears throat> because there's no historical connection between the Mayan writing system and any other known ancient, uh, ancient system. So, um, and, and that, uh, so that means that, that, uh, that what we are dealing with then is at least two, maybe more, independent emergences of writing in human history. So, and, and if it could happen twice independently, then it could, pro then it could happen the third or fourth or fifth time independently. So that, uh, so that there, there, from that, it follows that there need not be any, any stimulus diffusion kind of connection between ancient Egyptian, ancient cuneiform, and the Chinese writing systems, they, they could have developed independently as well. Um, okay, so that's just, just an aside, uh, not irrelevant to what we've been talking about, but not directly on point uh, either. Um, okay, so um, let's see, where do we go from here? So we, we were talking uh, last time at, at, uh, towards the, the end of class and um, about the difference between direct evidence of change and indirect evidence of change. The, um, we got our direct evidence in a number of, of ways. One was by the direct comparison of one stage with a later stage. Another was from the interpretation of texts where text is to be understood in a broad sense. And that's what you did with this, uh, with your breakout room exercise about, um, about the, uh, the song text and the Greek uh, uh, nasality or non-nasality in clusters with stops. Um, it also, uh, we, we saw that, that uh, you can, under the right conditions, comments that, that people make, sometimes just ordinary folks making observations about language that they happen to, to record somehow, that is to write down, uh, can, can lead us to uh, reasonable inferences about, uh, about uh, evidence of, of change. Uh, and that's, that's what led me to say that, um, <clears throat> that or led me to draw your attention to Lebov's uh, comment that historical ling linguistics is the, the art of making the most of what he called bad data. Um, that is, you, you kind of do what you can with all the scraps that, that, uh, that the whims of history uh, offer you. Um, and that's why, and I, did, I, I, I would uh, suggest that we use the term imperfect data rather than bad data because the, the data isn't necessarily mistaken. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just, there isn't very much of it and it's incomplete. So let, let me ask you, uh, I, I mentioned this last time, but let me ask you uh, for your thoughts. How is historical data that we deal with, how is it incomplete? What's missing from, uh, from the data that we work with in the limited, the limited uh, exposure that you've had so far to, to such data? Anyone? Maybe speakers of the languages? What, uh, how, how do you mean, Jackie? Like, especially with the moribund or dead languages that we've talked about, you don't get anyone who actually uses it in real life. Right, so what's, what's missing from, our, uh, from the, the, the pieces that we see written down on, on, on texts, whether it's a hieroglyph or whether it's, it's letters or whatever, uh, what do we not have? 
like pronunciation. Yeah, exactly. We have to, we, and that's where philology comes in. We have to make, we have to make reasonable guesses, reasonable interpretations that give us a sense of, of what the uh, pronunciation actually was. And even if we get the pronunciation, um, so even if we, e even if all of our, uh, all of our uh, uh, indications tell us that that the uh, that, that the Latin word for father, pater, um, began with a P. Uh, what do we not know about that P? Yeah, exactly. The, your, your silence is right because there's a lot that we don't know. I mean, so we have reason to believe that it was labial, but and that it was a stop. But was it aspirated? Was it have, if if it was aspirated, like the ancient Greek word for for brother is uh, usually written uh, uh, something like like that, where the where the, the ph stands for the Greek letter uh, phi. Um, But, and, and we believe that, that it was, uh, oops, we believe that it was um, aspirated uh, and the Greek grammarians actually uh, talk about breathing uh, be, uh, because it was distinct from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, from a, a letter um, that we transcribe as, as a, as if it were a P, plain P, as in the, the word for father in, in, in Greek is, uh, is pater also. But what we don't know is if this was aspirated, how heavily aspirated was it? Was it P or was it P like that? And, uh, and was there any, any uh, breath of, uh, of air that follows the, the unaspirated, even, even sounds that we uh, consider to be unaspirated uh, in in present day languages where we can observe them. So if you if you do uh, instrumental analysis of modern Greek P, which is said to be unaspirated, you will actually find some traces in 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 some instances of pronunciations uh, of words with initial P. You'll find a little bit of 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 uh, indication of some of some of uh, voicelessness uh, before the onset of the vowel that that is can be interpreted as as aspiration. So there. There are details that we don't know. We can get a general idea of uh, so if we if we know that 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 um, you know we have our old English word for um, which one was it? Our old English word for now was new. Uh, the the long mark we believe indicates uh, or, or the mark on top, the so-called uh, macron. Indicates length, but how long was it? How many how many milliseconds uh, was it? All we know is that it was probably uh, longer than um, it was longer than the thing that's written without the long mark. But how much longer? We don't know. How round was it? Was it ooh, very round, or was it ooh with less uh, lip rounding? Again, we don't know. And those are things that are probably we could never know. So there's an incompleteness to the uh, to the um, uh, to our historical record that we um, that we just have to live, learn to live with. We we make and we do, as Lebov said, we make the most of this imperfect uh, data. Okay, so um, so another. Another way in which we uh, we uh, said that you can have sort of direct evidence of change is just observation of language change within one's lifetime. This is what the the Kathleen Parker uh, exercise uh, uh, led us to eventually. That she had noticed something and she wrote about it. So in that sense, she is uh, like our um, comments from a lay commentator. Uh, but it it was something that she herself observed within her lifetime that she noticed that that there was this difference in the way people say uh, uh, respond to a uh, to thank you in a in a, a service kind of uh, uh, exchange. 
And we remember we ended last time by saying that not it's important to bear in mind that not all differences represent uh, change. In the example of three feet of rope versus three foot of rope, from our perspective, um, those of us who use uh, the plural here, uh, feet, three feet of rope, we might be inclined to say that, that it's the foot people who have changed. But in fact, uh, our interpretation of, of the facts uh, reflects just, or tells us that it's just the opposite, that the foot is the archaism here from an Old English genitive plural, and feet is the innovative form. So, <coughs> excuse me. So there has been a change, but the, um, the change is not in the direction that uh, the feet people like me and most of you, uh, 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 you said, um, uh, might, might think. So not everything that deviates from our usage is represents a change on the part of the other speaker. And this gets to, uh, speaks as well to the, um, uh, that basic issue that we'll, sheet that we'll come back to, but one of the basic issues we talked about it uh, the first day was e the evaluation question. How do we evaluate differences that we, uh, that we observe and in encounter? But there's a converse uh, to this uh, as well um, in that they are, um, we have to recognize that not all recurrences, not all things that are the same in different, uh, in different uh, uh, parts of the, of the large speech community, uh, not all things that converge are evidence of continuity. And as an example, I'd like to give you, uh, if I can find it uh, here. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, this is a, a um, <laughs> the title sounds kind of gross, pizza clippings, you wonder what's, what's up with that. But this is a guy at the University of Illinois writing in the uh, uh, 1984, it was, uh, writing in 1984. And he said in, serving his, in surveying his classes for campus slang, I learned, this is something that was new to him, I learned that pizza is referred to as za, and to eat or get a pizza is to do a za. So za here, he recognizes uh, to be a clipping of pizza, um, also found in reference to mushrooms and so forth. But this za, uh, I, I thought was was interesting, because for him, writing in nineteen eighty in nineteen eighty four, uh, it was a it was uh, new. He he, he said because uh, it was something that he had learned, so it was new new to him. But uh, going back just uh, um, uh, well, uh, about 20 years before then to the, to the 1960s, that was a term that, that I knew from my high school and college days, uh, ZA. And uh, a, when I was talking about this once in class some, some years ago, uh, a student uh, who uh, went to the University of Nebraska uh, in, the, uh, in the late uh, uh, 60s said, yeah, well, we said za also. So it, there's, it, for one thing, uh, it might be new to Dennis Barron, but it's not necessarily new to the language. That's an important thing to, to keep in mind. Uh, it's also the case that the, um, that, well, one way, of in, one way of interpreting this Especially since, uh, as we've we've seen examples of clipping already in, in in class, you remember the first day with our with our Menden example for Mendenhall uh, here on campus. Um, so another interpretation of this would be that um, let me one, would be uh, that um, the the there isn't a continuity between. Uh, the 1960s za and the and the 1980s za. They're in two different parts of the of the country, two different time periods. Uh, admittedly, close, relatively close in time, but still uh, two different time periods. So another interpretation of that is that the um, this represents what we could call uh, an independent origin in two different. Uh, places at two different times. 
And that might seem to be somewhat uneconomical uh, instead of explaining it as having a single origin, but it, but it accords with the, with the disparity in place and time. And also how, how um, uh, common is, uh, is clipping as a phenomenon in, uh, in uh, sort of more playful language use. Uh, any, any thoughts, anyone? Barron himself says, uh, gives another example of uh, clipping with, uh, with mushrooms being called shrooms. Uh, Eisner's on campus uh, being referred to as snurs and so forth. So how, suppose we, we and our own example of Menden and uh, for Mendenhall, um, suppose we, um, we accept that clipping is, um, as a somewhat, let's say natural, or at least uh, common uh, process. How does that bear on, on our interpretation here of independent origin for ZA in Nebraska and ZA in Illinois and ZA in, in uh, New York? Does anyone, anyone see what the, how to make this link between, if we admit that, that clipping is the natural or common process? Anyone? I was thinking maybe it could have origins just in that, like it's a common phonological process, especially for like kids and people who have like language impairments. So like it happens naturally because it's easy. Right, and if it can happen naturally because it's easy, then it could easily uh, arise in two different places at two different times. Mm -hmm. in, in, uh, one way of thinking about it is that, is that uh, is that speakers are all all speakers of English are uh, sort of um, uh, privy to the same kinds of input, They're the, the same uh, the same words and 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 expressions and 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 such, and if you add into that the naturalness of a of a clipping, then it's it's to be expected that you could have uh, the same thing arising independently in two different places at two different times. So that, that tells us that, that just as not all differences are representative of change in the way that we might think, not all, the, the opposite of change is continuity. Stability, I think, is how I referred to it uh, uh, earlier in the, in the term. Um, but conversely, not all recurring elements are evidence of continuity, especially, especially when we're dealing with, um, with natural um, uh, kinds of, of um, natural kinds of uh, processes. Do you all see that this is an important point that will that will will uh, come up again and again in our in our uh, analyses of of particular sets of data that we that we, we deal with. Now, how we define natural is is tricky to be sure. Um, I think um, you know we can draw attention to frequency, for instance. Uh, how often do we find examples of this? Do we find it in different populations? Do we find it in different different languages? Is it just an English thing? Well, no, it turns out there are clippings in all kinds of, of, of languages. So that um, uh, it's it seems to be just sort of part of the human experience with language and, and with interacting with, with the world. And therefore, we want to uh, all keep in mind that it could happen independently the conditions for it to arise are there in all sorts of different speech communities and therefore we can get independent origin uh, even of things that seem to be uh, similar. Um, I have kind of a cute example of this. Sure, please. Um, so I work with second graders three days a week and um, we write our schedule for the day on like a little whiteboard. So I think it started just as like a funny joke. They would come up and like erase the first letter of everything. Oh, yeah. But now they refer, like they commonly refer to like the things that were on the whiteboard with like one letter missing. So like um, we're doing like a winter theme for the past couple of weeks. And so whenever we do something with snowballs, they're no balls. Oh. Or um, when we go outside, it's side and like just like cute little things like that. And I think it's uh -huh. hilarious. It's really cute. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Thank you. That, no, I mean, I think, as I said, I think this is particularly then the... Um, uh, the 
uh, a reflection of sort of more playful, uh, the more playful side of, of, of language. We, we like to think of language as being for communication, but we actually use language for many, many more purposes than just communication. There's more to language than just giving the facts. We, it's, there's a, an expressivity, a playfulness, uh, identity marking, and so forth, other kinds of functions like that that we get with, with language. Thank you, these are, these are good examples. Um, um, just out of, out, of, uh, out of curiosity, what is the basis for the, uh, for the clipping that gives uh, Za from, uh, from pizza? What is, it, what is Za based on? Is it based on the pronunciation? Can it be based? The pronunciation is is uh, is is pizza, right? So how do you how how would you get a uh, clipping that gives you za out of pizza? So what, anyone see what the basis is for the uh, for the the clipping that gives pizza? It's that gives it off from pizza. Pardon? Who's that, Oscar? It's more of an orthographic like spelling. Yeah, exactly. It's based on the orthography. It's based on the spelling. So the clipping here is based on the spelling, the spelled form. And that's interesting um, because ling one of the things that linguists say that, that you probably encountered in your very first linguistics class is that we need to develop something like the International Phonetic Alphabet because we can't depend just on writing. Writing is not the same thing as language. Language is spoken and, or, or signed. Uh, uh, and therefore, we, uh, we need to um, uh, divorce ourselves from this idea that, that, that language is, is the written representation of, of, our, of our words. And it's one of the things we, we learn early on in our linguistics classes. But at the same time, in literate societies, highly literate societies, it's impossible, I think, to to separate the written form from the uh, from from the, the spoken form, and we can see that there's actually an interplay between language as represented in writing and language as it comes out uh, in our uh, in our oral or manual uh, production. And so, finding an example like <coughs> like Za, <coughs> where the uh, clipping is based on the spelled form is actually, uh, I think, an important uh, sort of wake up call that for all the fact that we say we deal with the spoken language, not with the written language, the writing is relevant for language users if you are literate and especially in a, in a sort of highly literate society like, uh, like ours, uh, it's impossible, I think, to, se to separate those out. And these clippings then give us a, a basis for saying, yes, we have to pay attention to the writing, uh, to the written representation. It's not irrelevant. Um, okay, so uh, that is... Professor. Yeah, question, yeah. Uh, and the one thing, and the, sometimes these clippings may become uh, the actual uh, word. Yeah. Like right. omnibus, right? Mm -hmm. Omnibus in the past, and in our days, just bus. Just bus or ad for advertisement. Yeah. Or uh, gym. Rep, rep for representative, right? Yeah. Representative. Those two rep. Gymnasium. As uh, as gym and so forth. And I will simply add after that dot, 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 because there are lots and lots of them. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah and I think, I think that then that speaks to, uh, to Jackie's point about the, the naturalness of this, of this uh, process. Whatever is involved in it, there, we, we find it quite, uh, uh, um, quite, pervasive, uh, quite pervasively in, uh, in, in language. And as I say, not just not just in English, but those of you who have access to other languages, uh, uh, you can look for examples of that in your in uh, in your other uh, the other languages that you know. Um, okay. <coughs> well, I'd like to. I, I'm not able to do this for every every class, but uh, there was there's a particular little exercise that we can do that I think lends itself well to uh, to uh, breakout rooms. So I'm going to. Um, I'm going to put you into breakout rooms in just a moment, but I want to show you what I have in mind for you. Uh, no. 
Uh, hang on a sec. Um, So I'm going to put this document in in your uh, in, in the chat in just a moment, <clears throat> um, and uh, and I want you to to uh, I'll give you a little more time than I did last time. I, th I think maybe I cut things short a bit uh, in the last one. I'll give you ten minutes this time, but it it concerns a um, uh, a situation that arose in my own life when I was coaching my uh, ten year old son's baseball team uh, in uh, in the suburb that I live in, Upper Arlington. Uh, a batter was hit by a pitched ball on his back. And one of the kids said something like, ooh, he really got beaned. And that intrigued me because for me, growing up in, uh, when I was 10 years old, growing up in New York in the 1950s, early 60s, bean meant to hit on the head, be hit on the head with a pitched ball, not to be hit anywhere in the body. So that led me to, as a linguist, of course, I was curious what's, 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 what's up with this. Uh, difference. And what I'd like you to do, uh, your task is to try to figure out what, uh, how you would go about investigating this uh, to determine whether it was a real uh, linguistic difference or just what, because it'll tell us, it ultimately it'll tell us uh, something important. So I'm going to go, I'm going to stop sharing and put this document in the chat for all of you. <clears throat> um, I think PDFs translate better there. Okay, it was sent successfully. So you should, you should all be able, and you should download that now because I think you, once you're in a breakout room, you don't have access to it. Um, and I will now put you, how many, there are 14, 13 of you. I'll put you into four or three breakout rooms. Oh, four, that way you can have a little more uh, interaction. Well, three, that'll be a little large. That way you get to know one another a little better. Okay, three breakout rooms. You'll have 10 minutes to, so re read over the, the document, um, think about it, discuss it amongst yourselves, and we'll reconvene in, uh, in 10 minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute uh, warning. Okay, good luck, everyone. You should be populating the breakout rooms and leaving me. Yes, good. Okay, great.
Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
Oh, hey, Austin, you're back. Good. Claire, Jeannie, excellent. Everyone's beginning to show up. 40 seconds. There you, go. you guys were all in the same room together? Yes. You made some progress? Yeah? yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Slowly, everyone's returning. You have 10 seconds, no, 15 seconds. And then forced out. The countdown begins, six, five, four, three, two, one, and everyone's back, just like that. <clears throat> Good. So how did it work? Um, okay, this time? Did you have did you have enough time to, to make some progress on this? This is this breakout room business is, is more or less new to me. So I'm, I'm still uh, figuring figuring out aspects of it. Okay. Um, well, who'd like to who'd like to uh, to talk and to explain what you what what you came up with. Okay, uh, Claire, go for it. Sorry. Um, so we kind of talked about how our first maybe hint that it could just be a generational thing is the fact that none of us have ever heard of the word beaned before, which could be the fact that like none of us have had experience with baseball, but it also mm -hmm. could be the fact that like it just kind of fizzled out as the years went by because I was born in 2000. So like 1990 was like a whole decade before I was born. So ancient history. Yeah. <laughs> so when we also talked about the fact that it could have just been like a fluke with one speaker, which I mean, I guess is how language ends up changing, mm -hmm. but it could have been a situation where one kid kind of misinterpreted um, like what the word being or being meant and like the commonplace definition of it. And he kind of overgeneralized okay. the application. Um Okay, fair enough. Um, how how would you go about investigating investigating that? Anyone? Uh, do you want to speak for your group? Uh, cool. Um. Yeah, we didn't talk a whole lot about um, how we would go about investigating it because we were kind of just the information we could find online wasn't necessarily like we didn't have a ton of information about it. Mm -hmm. But I guess what you could do is you could interview speakers of like different geographical areas, different locations and kind of okay. ask them to see like how they, or you could choose, or you could have them list a couple of contexts and have them pick the context that like best fits. Okay. So, so, um, so what, uh, anyone else have anything to add to that either from, from Claire's group or, or from another group? We could find also that it's a very old uh, slang from the 1905. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you mean the, the use of bean for head? Uh-huh, yeah. exactly. And there's, specific, and, and there's specific baseball usage for uh, to be hit on the head. As I said, it, it the meaning that I had as I was growing up that uh, accords with the etymology, but we know that etymology is not, is not destiny, that languages or words can change uh, the the meanings that they're attached to. So or head it, e, e, as a verb, this to to hit to hit it on the, the yeah, head. to hit on the head. It, yeah, that that was a specific baseball term, but and it was very, it was a specific very old one. Yeah, yeah. But how how would you go about? Um, uh, so Claire said, well, maybe you would interview people from different geographic uh, part different parts of the United States, fair enough. Who would you interview in, in, in a case like that? Would you interview kids? Would you interview adults like me? Or who, who would you, who would be relevant? Anyone, it doesn't have to be uh, Mar Marcia. You all, you all had some occasion to discuss this. Or within, in Upper Arlington itself, who would you, who would you, who would be a, a relevant uh, uh, point of, of would be good point. if we get different ages. So different could, ages, right? Yeah, so, because then we can, could check uh, which generation is using, right, or is still using it. So if you interview, if you interview someone of my age in Upper Arlington at the time, 
and ask them about being. That would be a way of controlling for geography, right? And in fact, that's exactly what I did. I grabbed one of the one of the parents, one of the dads, and I said, "Hey, did you? I don't know if you witnessed what just happened, but this kid was hit on the on the back, and and someone and one of the boys said that that he had been beaned." And I said, and I thought that was really weird because to me, being meant being hit on the head. And the guy said, yeah, yeah, you're right. That's what, yeah, I would have said, I would have just said it means hit on the head. You're right. So this, so someone of my age then, so that's controlling for, that's controlling for the, um, the age factor, the generational factor. And how would you control for the geographic uh, uh, factor? Claire says you could interview members of the little league or elementary teams across the country. Exactly. So you look at the at the so you control you control for, you keep the age group constant and control for geography, or you control for geography and uh, and um, and vary the the age groups. So it's a way of 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 getting at the, uh, the the question of what exactly is going on with this. And my my understanding is based on 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 what that uh, that dad uh, told me that we are, um, let me get back to sharing our screen now, that, uh, that what, we, what, we are, uh, what we were seeing was actually within the upper Arlington speech community, we have uh, differences that are generationally uh, uh, correlated. And this gives us a, uh, another way of interpreting differences that's referred to in the literature as apparent time, because a, a speech community is not uh, speakers all of the same age, but are the Upper Arlington speech community or any, almost you know any uh, uh, suburb or, or or city block or or whatever or or rural town and so forth has a uh, has a, a, a combination of people who are very young and people who are very old and people who are in between. There's someone being born right now. There's someone, unfortunately, who's dying now. Uh, and there, you know, it, it, it's just a, a fact of life. So, so the uh, speech communities are not are not um, stratified into different generational twenty year leaps, as it were. It's sort of a continuum of 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 uh, ages. So, within any speech community, we're going to find speakers who are older and are. Um, represent in a certain sense the language of their youth when they learned uh, uh, they learned their language we look we we our language can change throughout our lifetime but it does get sort of fixed in a in a in a uh, in a particular form uh, during our teens uh, probably um, depending on who we interact with and, and so forth it can be adjusted as we as we uh, go through life and, in, and encounter other people so that we, as I said in the first day, we all have a personal diachrony, as, uh, as it were. But it's my speech today is pretty much representative of my speech when I was in my in my teens. There there are some differences, but it's more or less uh, stable over the last fifty years of of of, of my life. Um, and so that gives us then a construct that linguists refer to as apparent time, as opposed to um, uh, real time. Real time would be the, the unfolding of, uh, a day by day, year by year, and so forth. But apparent time would be, if you look at a synchronic slice uh, based on age differences in a synchronic slice of the language, So that, um, so that uh, with regard to this uh, example of Bean in Upper Arlington, and, and, and actually I, I, I checked first, what, 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 was a, what was a crucial geographic fact about the father that I asked uh, about the word for Bean? What, what's a crucial geographic ge or demographic fact about him that I would, that I would wanna know? If he was from Upper Arlington, or yeah, New York. exactly. Was he from Upper Arlington? And he was. So I checked with that. I said, okay, did you did you grow up in Upper Arlington? Yes. All right, good. You're about my age, right? Yes. Okay. What what do you think of, of this use of being? So again, that's sort of controlling for for some of these uh, differences that um, that could, in principle, play a role in the uh, in this 
linguistic difference that that was this observable linguistic difference. So this this construct, this apparent time construct, is a very uh, useful one because society is is not stratified. It's it's not all homogeneous. The college community is a is a bit uh, a bit unnatural in that regard because you have this large concentration of people in their in their twenties, uh, roughly, uh, and um, and and whereas in in society at large, we tend to have more of a continuum across uh, very young speakers, very old, uh, very old speakers, and people in between. So we can exploit that um, <clears throat> that uh, age difference and um, and uh, develop a model of uh, by by pr projecting the usage of the older speakers back to their youth. That sort of leap gives you a, a leap back uh, some. Uh, 50, 60, 70 years sometimes in, uh, in terms of, of usage. So we can distinguish between apparent time and real time and that and we can exploit the apparent time differences to give us an indication of, of uh, language uh, change. It's important, of course, as always, to realize that not all apparent, not all generational differences um, equal uh, uh, evidence of change uh, uh, in, the, in the speech uh, community at large. Um, so we can think of something, again, uh, to draw on a fairly mundane example, we can think of the way uh, um, children uh, address their, their parents. It's <coughs> It's not uncommon for males. I had two male children, so, I, uh, so that was my, uh, my main point of reference, but it's not all that uncommon for, for male children around the age of six or seven to switch from calling their mother mommy and to, uh, to calling, them, uh, calling the mother something like, like mom or, or mother. So there's uh, mommy sort of sounding like a, more like something that a little boy would say and mom or mother being a more uh, adult uh, or an older child's uh, way of, 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 um, of addressing the, uh, the mother. So, um, but is this, this is a generational change so that you can find uh, people who are say five or six years old saying mommy and, and uh, males who are uh, 26 years old saying mom or mother and so, oh, is, you say, is that a generational difference? Am I witnessing a, a change in uh, ad, uh, terms of address? And the answer is, is probably no, because this seems to be, um, you might say, age-related or age-appropriate uh, notions of, 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 of usage, so that uh, it's so that at any period in, let's say, modern American English, uh, we will find a divide between the mommy speakers and the mother speakers. It's not that mommy is going out of use, it's going out of use for individuals as they mature, as they get, uh, get, get older. So not all generational differences are evidence of, of, of change. So we always have to be, be careful. We can notice these things and it's important to notice these things. It's useful, it's interesting to notice these things, but we always have to apply our analytic uh, reasoning, our analytic tools uh, to them to see just what uh, what actually is going on with them. Okay, um, so that the this this sort of exhausts the uh, the um, uh, direct evidence for change. So the apparent time co construct is maybe not not direct in the same way that that uh, that uh, comparing uh, our texts from old English and modern English uh, were, was a direct was direct evidence, but it's um, but it's still uh, working with, with uh, real uh, uh, live language data, so to speak. Um, and what it tells us also is that the, um, oh, I didn't find one more. What it tells us also is one of these, one of these basic issues that we, uh, uh, on this sheet that I will refer to repeatedly throughout the semester. Notice that one of them was the, um, the embedding problem. How is a given language change embedded in the surrounding system of linguistic and social uh, 
um, uh, relations. So we have to understand the um, this issue with with uh, being or the or the issue with mommy and mother and so forth. We have to understand those as embedded. They aren't just isolated bits of language. They're embedded in in a in a, in a particular social structure. They're uh, pertinent to particular ages, to particular uh, groups of people, to, uh, to particular defined in, in in various ways, defined maybe geographically, defined uh, in terms of of age, defined in terms of gender. Uh, there are other kinds of of, uh, of ethnicity can play a role. There are other kinds of of social factors, so uh, other kinds of demographic factors that can uh, that can uh, play a role, and we have to be sensitive to all of that and try to understand how a given language change, or in our case, a, a given language difference that we notice is embedded in the surrounding system of social relations. And there's and relevant to that as well is what we talked about the first day, the evaluation problem. How do members of a speech <coughs> community evaluate a given change? And what's the effect of this evaluation on the change or on the difference, we might say. Um, so the the example of, of, uh, of Bean, I evaluated it in a particular way. I, uh, I, I still use it in the sense that I used it 60 years ago, but, um, but I'm, uh, I've, I'm aware, I've learned more and I know about it. Okay, uh, when I'm talking to a, to a younger kid, uh, to a younger speaker, Bean referring just to head might not make any sense to them. So I have to, so that, that's something I have to pay attention to in my, in my own usage. So you evaluate these things and you, and you can sometimes adjust your, your usage uh, accordingly. We'll come back to these, uh, these issues. There's more to be said about all of them, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to them uh, as the semester wears on. So I, in, in the uh, 15 minutes remaining, I'd like to uh, go back to the uh, comparative method and specifically Look at the Berman uh, problem that we that you did for for homework. But you all did quite well uh, for the most part. There were a few little wrinkles that we need to iron out, but that's what you're in class for is to learn these things. Uh, we said the, uh, a couple classes ago and, and last class as well that um, <clears throat> that we we can think of the comparative method as really a kind of horizontal comparison across languages uh, as opposed to the vertical comparison that gives you, that we talked about with regard to direct lineal uh, descent. And in that way, we developed a model for uh, using the comparative method as uh, indirect evidence of, of change in this, in this way. I won't repeat all of this because we've gone through it before. Um, <clears throat> when we apply it to a particular example, like our Burmese case, or Burman case involving these three, uh, Burman languages, Burmese, Atsi, and Maru. Um, the, uh, you were given very specific instructions and, and all of this was a very controlled kind of exercise. These are related languages. So, uh, so um, this, this model would hold. These are languages that uh, you were drawn, at, your attention was drawn to particular features, namely the, the fricatives and the nasals that were not necessarily identical but were uh, were comparable between the two uh, between the, the the languages involved. Uh, they were um, so so all of that was was already given uh, as as a, as a starting point. And all you had to do all you had to do was just identify what the matching elements are. And we use this term correspondence uh, as a technical term referring to the, the matching elements. And we develop a set of correspondences. So the, the, in this second word here, the theta corresponds to the sh in Atsi, corresponds to the sh in, in Maru. In this third case, uh, the Burmese th corresponds to the Atsi s and to the Maru s. And, and we, uh, you can look through the data and notice that, that that correspondence set, the theta corresponding to sh, corresponding to sh, recurs in other uh, words. Where else does it recur besides in two? Where else do we find it? Anyone, this is an easy question, but I'd, I'd like someone to say it if they, if they would. Where else does four, that? I'm four sorry, and in, eight. Right, in number four and number eight, and what about number six? 
This is a case where our data is incomplete, imperfect, right? But it looks like it's the same, this, it's, it's likely to be the same. And most of you, so you were specifically asked, well, what about, what would you expect the Maru form to be? And everyone answered that uh, appropriately that you would expect it to, to start with whatever you decided, uh, uh, what, what, whatever you, you recognize in the Atsi form, given the, the parallelism uh, between Atsi and, and Maru in two and four and eight, your expectation is that the Maru form, if it existed, would similarly have a, a sh. So this this is is a way in which the uh, the comparative method give, it really gives us a uh, an ability to make predictions about the kinds of words that we should find, and that can that can help you. It, it may be that there is a Maru word that 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 fits here, but it doesn't mean iron. Maybe it means something. Uh, uh, or it doesn't mean knife, maybe it means something completely different. Uh, but you can trace the semantic uh, uh, relationship, even the semantic relationship between knife and iron. Can anyone make sense of that? It means iron in Burmese, it means knife in Atsi. Anyone? A knife might be made out of iron. Yeah, that's a reasonable, a reasonable uh, hypothesis, and, and that would give you then a basis for saying that uh, that even though these are, are different, uh, the meanings are different. We could we could nonetheless uh, think of them as being uh, a matching set in a certain sense. Um, okay, let me uh, let me just. Uh, so we start by looking for what I'll call matchings, and we can write them. Uh, I like to to write them in terms in in, in these terms, um, or with uh, you, you'll see them written in in, in various ways in uh, in different textbooks. I what I like to use is a is a tilde, the squiggle, um, and we had what ash. And the reason for that is it's, it's just a way of, of, of lining them up. There are, you will also see, um, you will also see it's written uh, in some books as, and including the, the, the textbook that you're uh, using, you'll see it written with a, uh, a slash. I, I prefer not to use that because slashes can mean you know, have an interpretation with regard to phonemic uh, units, and that can get confusing uh, if you're not if you don't pay attention carefully. You will also see some people write them as um, uh, with equal signs, and there's a sense in which that's reasonable because they're equivalent in their systems and in their place in the in the in the words that we're comparing. They're equivalent, but again, I think the the equal sign makes you think that somehow a theta is equal to a sh, well, no, it isn't. A theta is uh, interdental and a sh is palatal. So they aren't really equal in a certain sense. So I would, I would urge you uh, not to use the slashes, not to use the uh, equal signs. Uh, there are others that you might, uh, other separating elements like commas or, or, or or uh, bullet points or whatever, but I, this is what I like: is is using the the uh, squiggles, as I call them, or the tilde, if you will. Um, and when we uh, we don't, you weren't asked to do it here, <clears throat> but eventually we will have to pay attention to uh, to where to the environment in which uh, in which the sounds uh, uh, occur when we're comparing sounds. So I would. Um, in this case, I would uh, encourage you to use this kind of notation, a slash meaning in the environment of, that's another reason not to use slashes here, slash it meaning in the environment of, if it's a matter of word boundaries using <coughs> a crosshatch for the, what do you call it, the hashtag sign for, uh, for word boundaries and underlined like that to indicate where the sound occurs. So that we might talk about um, 
it doesn't it isn't necessarily relevant here, but we might talk about uh, say this for meaning in the environment of inter uh, between vowels. Uh, this would be in the environment of after a, a consonant and, uh, and and so forth. So the slash here then <coughs> equals in the environment of. And I would I would encourage you to uh, to use that notation. Um, I won't force you to if you want to write things out in words. Okay, that's fine. If you want to devise your own interpretation, your own notation, that's that's your business, I guess. But this is this is very uh, common uh, notation. The slash meaning in the environment of the underscores uh, giving you the the point the place where that sound occurs. So the, this would be um, the sh in, in our analysis here, the, the theta or the show would occur, uh, oops, would occur there. Um, the hashtag is used for word boundary. And if it's hashtag at the beginning, then the word boundary uh, is, this tells you it's the first sound, the word boundary, and then the, then the sound. If you have in the environment of like, that what would that what would that uh, be in words? What would this environment be? If the word boundary is at the end of the word, what would a word sound be? final? Yeah, this would be word final. Yeah, exactly. So, <clears throat> uh, and sometimes you will see we have to be very specific about it. it's not just any vowel but certain kinds of vowels, not just any consonant but certain kinds of consonants. All of which led um, my uh, one of my mentors, uh, Calvert Watkins, one of the great historical linguists of the 20th and into the 21st century, though he passed away a few years ago, <coughs> to say the following. He was joking a bit, but he said, the first step in the comparative method is you have to know what to compare. So we look for matching elements, but we're guided by uh, what kinds of things are likely to match up and what, uh, what patterns uh, do we see in the data at hand. So we see in number three and number uh, and number seven and number five and and, uh, and oh well let, let's look at three and nine we see the theta in Burmese corresponding to the s in Atsi and the s in Maru when we look at this first one the we're not sure what to do about the the w and 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 um, uh, it might well you might well uh, think that the that what's going on here is um, that we have, we have to pay attention to a, uh, a zero, that is the, f and the matching, if there are, if you say, well, there are four segments in the Burmese, how do we get four segments in Atsi? Well, by introducing a zero segment, and then it looks like we have the, the correspondence set is, um, would be theta uh, to um, to zero to uh, to s, and then uh, w to uh, you can see it gets a little. Harry here, W to S to, well, there's a lot missing in the Maru case, right? So, so this, uh, I'll just put dot, dot, dot here. This <clears throat> is a plausible way of going about it, but if you want to keep in mind that the, um, that the, uh, the elements that you're comparing should be comparable in, in some sense. And uh, this this set here of the uh, W and S uh, leads to a somewhat uh, problematic kind of matching. Okay, we are. My phone tells me that we are out of time, so I'll stop here. I have a homework assignment for you. It's it's in it's another comparative method uh, problem, a little bit more complicated, but I but but uh, the uh, parameters are spelled out very carefully. So read through. This is due on on. Uh, 
I think I said Sunday night at 11.59 to give me a chance to look at them before class. Uh, read, read the instructions carefully. Read the comments that I made on your Burmese uh, uh, Atsi Maru uh, uh, homework and look at the textbook for reading. And if you have questions, you can always uh, shoot me an email. Uh, and I have office hours uh, at four o'clock today uh, as well. Okay, good. Well, another okay. good class. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'll stop sharing and we will return to, well, I guess I won't stop sharing. So I'll see you all in, uh, in uh, good time on Monday. All right. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yes, thank you. There we go. Stop sharing. And I'm the only one left. Good. <laughs>